We are so thankful for you for joining us for this uh, worship service. I hope that uh, you are doing well and I hope that you are having a, uh, a wonderful Lord's Day. Uh, for our service uh, this, uh, this morning, uh, we will have a, one of the elders here at the Porsche Church of Christ. You know, Tom, Tom Dunlap is going to lead us in a prayer. Uh, we are going to, then we'll have our lesson and then we will have uh, the Lord's Supper. And so thank you so much for, uh, for joining us and I hope that uh, you enjoy uh, this lesson. Good morning. Would you pray with me? The most kind and loving Father in heaven, we come to you on this beautiful Lord's Day to say thank you for all you've blessed us with. Thank you for that great sacrifice on the cross. Lord, was your church here at Portia as we try to meet and we're going through this crisis with the virus. We now are having to do things different. We're so thankful for Seth that he can put his lessons on Facebook on Sunday morning and Wednesday night Bible school and that we can all watch it and take the Lord's Supper with him. Lord, we'd ask you to look over our prayer list here. We have several on it. Ask you to be, be, subject, be receptacle to their, to their needs and we know it's your will it'll be done and not ours. But we want to add some to that. We want to ask you to watch over Bill Hilburn's family as They've lost a loved one there, and Brother Bill will be no, be no longer with us. Also, Lord, we ask you to be with Marilyn Adams. This is Dwayne Adams' wife. She fell and broke her neck, and she's in the hospital in Memphis. Thank you so much for all that you do for us. And You know, Lord, as we try to get back into the swing of things and be where we can meet and fellowship and worship together, we're going through some trying times. You know, there's a lot of people around this country that's lost loved ones. We'd ask you to be with them. There's a lot that's got this virus that's having a lot of issues. Be with them and strengthen them as only you can. Ask you, Lord, to want to say thank you to our military men and women service, also for our police officers, for our first responders, our firemen, for our doctors, and for our nurses for the great work they're doing. Also, for those delivery guys and for those that stock in the grocery stores that we can get our groceries and try to stay safe and healthy. Lord, we'd ask you to be with the church as it, we try to grow here at Portia and get over this situation. We'd ask you, to, we'd ask you Lord, to forgive us of our sins because we know we do fall so short. Go with us now and guide, guard, and direct us. And we meet again. It's our prayer in your son's holy name. Amen. Hello, this is Seth Parnell, the minister at the Portia Church of Christ. And I want to thank you so much for tuning in and for listening to this lesson. I hope that you are doing well and I hope that you are staying safe out there. This, uh, for this lesson, we are going to take a look at a man by the name of Jephthah and that we find in Judges uh, chapter 10. The, the land of Israel is a, has a very tumultuous history, as is, as is the case with any nation that you take a look at thousands of years you know, of their history. The nation of Israel had a, uh, a pretty rough time of it in, in different parts uh, different parts of their history. War was something that they were very familiar with and as you go throughout the uh, the Bible story starting from the book of Genesis and the time of Abraham and go all the way to the Gospels, you know, war is something that is very common uh, to the nation of Israel. You can go back to the time in which uh, Abraham when he uh, went against the kings of Sodom in order to free his son Lot, in order to uh, get his nephew back. He went to war with the kings of Sodom and was victorious in what he did. You could take a look at the days of David in which David uh, subdued uh, all the nations around him. He expanded the borders of Israel uh, to a, a great degree 
setting the stage for the most you know, prosperous reign uh, in the history of Israel for his son you know, Solomon. You could take a look at the uh, time of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, in which uh, 800,000 uh, soldiers you know, from the northern kingdom came up against uh, the, the southern kingdom and, and, uh, in a conflict you know, that they had. You could take a look in the days of Josiah, when the nation of Egypt came up to oppress Israel and to, uh, and to raid and to, uh, to oppose uh, them, and how Josiah had to deal with uh, is with Egypt you know, coming against them. You, know, you, you could see that the Assyrians, you know, they came against Israel in the days of Hezekiah. The Babylonians came against Israel in the, the days of King Zedekiah, the last king in, um, uh, that Israel would have. You know, the Romans were in charge in the days of the apostles. You know, the, the history of Israel is, is marked with conflict and marked with um, uh, with, com with, uh, with oppression you know, from uh, neighboring nations. And in, in Judges chapter 11, there is, this is you know, no exception. You know, we find a, another case in which Israel is facing the possibility you know, of, of war. And uh, they're under attack you know, by, a, you know, by a nation called the, uh, the Ammonites, or a group of people called the Ammonites. And the Ammonites, they make a claim that historically, you know, the land that Israel was occupying you know, was theirs. You know, they say, before you, know, you guys came in, before you came out of Egypt, before you arrived here, you know, this land is ours. And so we're going to take it back. You know, who, and who is going to stop us? You know, we're going to take this land back. This is going to be you know, for us. And so... They, uh, they set their mind to do this. But at this point in the, in the uh, history you know, of Israel, there is no king. You know, there is no uh, centralized you know, government, but every man did what was right in his own eyes. Every man did what he thought you know, was best and what he thought he should do. And so there was, was no king. And so the... The uh, the elders you know, of of Israel, you know, the people who were uh, who were in charge of that of the the immediate you know, area, you know, what, what what is referred to as the elders you know, of Israel, they kind of panic and they say, how can we uh, face this threat? How can we get through you know, this this conflict? You know, what are we going to do? Well, in Judges chapter eleven and verses five through six, we find. Uh, they find their solution. In Judges chapter 11, verses 5 through 6, it says, And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our leader, that we may fight against the Ammonites. They go out and they recruit an outcast by the name of Jephthah in order to be uh, their leader, in order to lead them in this conflict. Now Jephthah, he was a a literal you know, outcast. He wasn't an outcast in the sense that he didn't fit in with society, or in the, in the sense that no one liked him. But he was literally driven from his home, you know, chased away you know, by his brothers because they they didn't want to share an inheritance with someone you know, like him. You know, the truth of the matter was that, that these brothers were actually his half brothers because. He was the son of a prostitute that his uh, his father had, uh, had had kept around, and so he was. And so because of this, his his half brothers looked down upon him for this, and eventually chased him away because they didn't want to share anything you know, with uh, with this man, and they didn't want anything to do with Jephthah. But it's funny how those little things and how those those uh, things you know, such as this, how those little things lose their importance when a crisis appears. When a, when a conflict appears, sometimes those little things, they, they go away. They don't matter anymore. And they, they didn't want anything to do with Jephthah until they were in trouble, until they, uh, they find themselves in a pretty uh, unsure situation. And so, uh, and... and, and 
and why is this? You know, why would they come to Jephthah for this? Well, if you look at verse 1 of Judges chapter 11, what does it say? It says that he was a mighty warrior. You know, what do you need in a time of war? Well, you need a mighty warrior. You need somebody who is strong enough, somebody who is skillful enough, somebody who is brave enough in order to protect you from those who would seek to do you harm, from those who would seek you know, to oppress you. And so they went to Jephthah in this case, and they said, you, you bring us, uh, you, you come back to us and be our leader, and, and we will get, you will be our head, you, know, you will be the leader you know, of our people. And so, in looking at this, you know, we need to be careful you know, as people and as Christians you know, not to let the little things you know, drive people away. Not to let those things that may seem you know, big up close, but when you take a step back and, and look at it from the, the big picture, you find out that these things don't really matter you know, so much. Because God can use people uh, in a big way you know, later times if we, if we let them. Now, there's a passage that we read about in James uh, chapter 2, in verses 1 uh, through 5, in which James, he talks about uh, showing the, the dangers of showing your partiality. In James chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, it says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, You sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, You stand over there, or sit down at my feet. Have you not made then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James, he, he's telling his, his readers, he's telling his people, you know, don't let these little things shape how you see people. Don't let these little things define your perspective of, of others. Because when you look at the, the true worth you know, of a person, when you look at the true character you know, of a person, you know, what they wear, you know, what they drive, you know, what they... Uh, you know, how big you know, their, their house is, those things become insignificant. They end up not mattering as much when you take a look at the, the, true, uh, the true picture you know, of, a, of a person. We need to be careful not to, not to base our opinions and our, our perspective of people on, on these little things. Because it's easy to, uh, to take you know, one thing that we know about a person and fill in the rest of the blanks you know, ourselves and assume that we know that person well. And it's much harder to actually uh, get to know them, to actually uh, to, to converse with them and to uh, find out just who they, they truly are. That's a, a more difficult task. And so for the reason, not many people may do that. But we, we need to be careful of what we choose, uh, of what we, the information that we use in order to, uh, in order to, to, uh, to give our, our image of somebody, you know, we need to be careful that's not something that is uh, insignificant in the big picture. Because one thing that this quarantine has, has done, and this situation that we are in you know, right now has done, is it has made us reshape our priorities. It has made us change, you know, what we do and, and how, how we do it. You know, on a normal average day, we may be distracted by a myriad of, of different things, of places we had to go, of things we had to do. But when the news broke that we might be, be having problems, you know, what did people do? They, they went to the store and they, they bought their uh, necessities. You know, their, their priorities, you know, changed. You know, if we ever get uh, the indication that snow is coming, that we're going to have a, a couple of inches of snow, you know, people usually that they go to the store and they they get you know their their necessities, their their priorities you know change, because when there is a, a crisis, suddenly those little things you don't matter so much. Those little things 
end up shrinking in the, in the face you know, of a crisis. And this is what happens here in the story you know, with Jephthah and his relationship with the, the elders of Gilead. But there's also an application that we can get for us as, as Christians as well. Because there are many people in this world uh, today that are facing a crisis in their spiritual life. You know, they may, uh, they may be having, you know, doubts about, you know, uh, about who God is. You know, why should I serve God? You know, maybe my, my faith is, is just uh, shrinking or maybe it's, it's non-existent. You know, many people, you know, may be having a, a crisis, you know, in their, their uh, spiritual life. But what does this story tell us? You know, in a crisis, those little things, they end up, you know, not mattering as, as much as maybe we, we thought they were. To be somebody, you know, that is a Christian, somebody that has o obeyed, you know, the commandments of God, that has obeyed the, the the path to salvation that is specified in the scriptures. If a person has their sins who washed away you know, by the blood of Jesus Christ, you know, they they are they have that relationship with him. They are someone that is that is good. They are somebody that is walking on you know the right path. You know, that doesn't mean that they uh, that they still have to live a life that is that is uh, worthy that is glorifying to God you know, they still have to walk in that that narrow road but God is somebody you know, that has uh, that gi that gives forgiveness he's somebody that offers you know grace and so when uh, if you think about you know what what can I do in order to be to be close to God look at the scriptures and look at what he has told us you know to do as people and how we should uh, come in contact you know, with you know, the blood uh, of Jesus Christ. Because if you don't have forgiveness of sins, if you don't have a, um, if you're not somebody that is, uh, that, uh, that their soul is in a saved state, then all those other things, no matter how many uh, other things they are, they ended up not mattering, you know, not, uh, not mattered uh, too much. You know, they, uh, they end up uh, being smaller maybe than we anticipated. And so we have to realize you know, that in a, in a crisis, you know, our priorities change and sometimes we have, to, uh, we have to do things a little bit differently. But I think to fully understand the, the story of, of Jephthah, we have to look at, a, at a few things first. We have to understand a few things about the nation you know, of, of Israel. First, you have to you have to look at where Israel is you know, during this moment. You know where is Israel uh, as far as their their spiritual state, as far as their relationship to God. Where are they in this uh, story you know, of of Jephthah? Well, throughout this book, you know of Judges, we find a cycle that occurs over and over and over and over again. You know the phrase Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord occurs six times before this story. And this is only chapter, uh, there's only chapter 10 and chapter 11, but yet six times, you know, this phrase, Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, you know, shows up. And it could possibly be assumed in, uh, in other places as well. And, you know, this is not really a surprise because if you take a look at Judges chapter 2 and verses 16 through 23, you know, Judges 2, 16 through 23. It kind of gives you a framework of how this book is going to go. It gives you a uh, kind of a, a guide as to how this story is going to unfold throughout the, the book of Judges. Of judges. You know, judges are raised up to deliver Israel from oppression, but their influence only lasts as long as they are alive. And when they when they end up, when they are gone, you know, the people spiral again into a life of idolatry and a life of, of selfish living. But in the days of in the days of Joshua, you know, this was really the the peak, you know, of Israel's you know, faithfulness. You know, what did what did Joshua tell them? He said, "You know, choose you this day in whom you will serve." And the the Israel the elders of Israel said, you know, "We will serve God." 
And we will be with you, Joshua, and we will serve him. And they did. But years later, when we get here to to Judges chapter 10, the landscape is a, a lot different. The uh, with each judge, you know, they they drifted you know, further and further away you know, from God, and things you know, were were getting worse. If you take a look at uh, at a an example, the if you go out you know, to the ocean, you know, one of the dangers that you'll find uh, at the at the ocean is called a rip current, and a rip current is something that is uh, it can be quite deadly. You know, it is. It has a danger of pulling you away from shore very quickly and in a, uh, a strong enough manner to where uh, even the, the stronger swimmers out there who can't overcome it, they'll still be, still be pulled out until you're out there in, uh, in deep water. Israel, you know, at this time, was able at times to get their head above water. You know, they were able to... Uh, you know, to, to get their head up to where they could breathe, you know, just a little bit, you know, spiritually speaking. But throughout every judge, you know, they were drifting further and further and further away, you know, from the shore. They, until they get to the point to where they lost the fight, you know, they, they lost the will to fight a, a spiritual battle. And by the end of this book, you know, we find a morally collapsed uh, society, you know, a a uh, group of people that really had no morals, you know, whatsoever. A day in which it's almost unrecognizable to the time of, of Joshua and the, the faithfulness that the people had, you know, during his day. And and so the the writer of, of the book of Judges is telling us, you know, that, you know, things are getting worse. You know, things are not getting better when Israel is, is delivered you know, from these oppressions, but things, they, they are getting worse. If you look at, um, at the beginning you know, of, of this book, you know, there's only two false gods that are mentioned, two idols that Israel uh, worships. They are uh, Baals and Ashtaroths, which is the, these two, two false gods that uh, they worship. And if you read throughout the Old Testament, you know, uh, Baal is something that comes up you know, quite frequently. You know, Israel struggled uh, with it on, on several occasions. But if you take a look at Judges chapter 10 and verse 6, you know, what does this you know, tell us? Judges chapter 10 and verse 6. It says, The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of, of the Lord. You know, that phrase that we said occurs you know, six times. Here it is again. And it says, And served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. They are seven you know, false gods here mentioned in Judges you know, chapter 10. And so the, the writer is telling us, you know, things are not better, but they are getting you know, far worse. And now, not only are the people of Israel, uh, not only have they you know, forsook God and started doing their own things, you know, their immorality, their idolatry is progressively you know, getting worse. And now they are serving just about anything under, under the sun. And they are forsaking the Lord and are not, not serving Him. And the, the degradation of their faithfulness had found its way into its its a uh, its leadership and into its influential you know, people. This is likely the reason why Jephthah was able to uh, stay with his family uh, in the first in the first place, even though his mom you know, was a, a a prostitute. It's possible you know the Bible doesn't explicitly say this, but it's possible that. Jephthah's mom was a was a temple priestess, and she worked in a a pagan temple. You know, fornication was something that was uh, often included in pagan worship, and so this would, uh, in the culture you know, of this time, this would make it you know all right. You know, this would kind of sanction the fact that uh, his father you know would would do this. You know, people saw those who were faithful to God and those to uh, were faithful to these false gods. You know they were they were pretty much the same. You know they were, 
Yeah, it didn't matter, you know, what you served, you know, either one, you know, would be fine. You know, they, they didn't see any distinction between the one true God and all of these these false gods. And and so this is so that we can see that the state that Israel uh, is in. But the second thing uh, to look at is we have to examine who exactly recruits, you know, Jephthah to this role of being a judge. You know, who comes and gets him? We know that there is a, a pattern, you know, there is a way in which these judges were brought up to, to save Israel. Uh, if you take a look at throughout the past judges, there is a, a pretty obvious you know, pattern you know, that occurs. If you take a look at Judges uh, chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel, who saved them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. It says, but he says, but the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel. You take a look at Judges uh, chapter 3 and verse 15. What does it say? It says, then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer. Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. We also know that Gideon he was recruited by an angel, and so you could see uh, the pattern here. It's not the people who chose these, uh, you know, these judges, but it says the Lord you raised them up. The Lord has raised up Othniel. He raised up Ehud. You he uh, got Gideon you know, into that role. But how does Jephthah's story start? You know, how does how has he gotten into into this role? It says the elders of Gilead. They came and said to Jephthah, you know, come, come fight for us. It's not God who gets who uh, gets Jephthah into this role, but it's the elders of Israel who come and say, um, you are you are you know, what we need. You know, they they don't inquire of God, but they see a mighty warrior and they say, you know, th this is what we need. You know, this is uh, this is what's going to save us. And while God was able to use Jephthah, He was able to use him for some uh, to do some some big things. God was not the first stop you know, for these elders, but yet they thought they could play the role of of problem solvers. They thought that they could solve this problem through their own uh, own intellect, their own wisdom in in what they did. But the Bible you know, repeatedly tells us that that is a pathway that is only destined for destruction. There's a passage that we read about in Ephesians chapter two and verse eight, where he says. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, but it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You know, what does Paul say here in Ephesians? He says you are saved through faith, this is not from yourselves. It is not by works, so that no one can boast. You know, this is not from yourselves. One of the hardest things that, uh, that people can learn when they approach this idea of spirituality and bring close to God is that I cannot do this you know, by myself. I cannot you know, save myself. I cannot walk this narrow road by myself. You know, I cannot be somebody that survives you know, by you know, myself. The, admitting this, you know, it doesn't make you weak. It doesn't make you uh, less than anyone else, but we are, but Paul tells us. He says, you, know, you, "You are saved. You through grace. You through faith. You through through obedience. This is not something that comes from you, but it comes as a gift. You're from God." And so we need to be sure that when we reorder these priorities, when we reorder, you know, uh, our pro when we approach uh, a a things that kind of shake our world, you know, that God doesn't get dropped down the list. He doesn't. Uh, get dropped down to a um, to a, a non-essential role, and, and we don't take up the role of problem solver you know, ourselves and try to fix everything you know, by ourselves. But God, He certainly plays a role you know, in this. But, but we can be a person on the other side. You know, we can be a person that says, you know, no matter the circumstances, no matter 
you know, what is going on in my world, no matter how these things affect me, I still go to God because God is my strength. You know, he is, is my shield. There's a passage in Psalm chapter 28, and verse 7. It says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exults, and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In, in him my heart trusts. You know, no matter what happens in life, no matter how anxious that may make you feel, how much worry you know, goes along, you know, how, how deep it might wound you, you know, we serve a God who is mighty in power. And we serve a God who, even though we were uh, in a, a worthless state, even though we were a people that didn't have anything to offer in return, he, he came down, he sent his son to die on a cross you know, for us. And you know, we serve a God that not only is powerful, but also loves us enough to sacrifice anything. And... If that is not encouraging to you, if that is not something that uh, emboldens you, you know, to live, uh, to live, you know, in a life of service, you know, to Him, you know, it's it's definitely something to 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 keep in mind. You know, we we can't forget about God because we know He won't forget you know, about us, and we know that He's always has a, our best interests, you know, at at heart, and. And uh, these these Israel needed to learn this. They needed to to understand this and to to know that you know, God, if they would you know serve Him and give their life to Him, He would be on their side. But yet they thought that they could take this you know, by themselves. And so I hope we we understand that uh, we can't let the the little things in life you know dictate you know, how we treat people or how we even how we approach God. But, and we also, you know, we, we can't be somebody that tries to solve everything, you know, by ourselves. But we must understand that, that God is mighty, He is strong, and that He can uh, get us through in these tough situations that we find ourselves in. I hope this lesson was encouraging to you. Next week, we will take a look at part two of the story and keep... Uh, Keep examining the, this man, Jephthah, and see what he has uh, to offer. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope that you have a, a blessed day. For the Lord's Supper this morning, we are going to take a look at a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. And this is what uh, Paul has to say to the Corinthians concerning the Lord's Supper. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup, and after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For, often, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we, as Christians, that's what we, we want to do, you know, with our life. We want to proclaim, uh, proclaim Jesus, you know, in, in everything that we do. Proclaim his death you know, until, uh, until we are gone, because we understand the, uh, the importance, the significance of what he has done, you know, for us, and how he has, uh, and uh, all, the, all that he went through in order to give us a chance, in order to give us, you know, hope. And so we never want to forget, you know, the sacrifice of Jesus, and that's, uh, that's a big reason why you know, we, we take the Lord's Supper, you know, every first day of the week. And so that we can uh, always proclaim you know, the death you know, of our Lord. And so if you would, you please, please bow with me. Lord, we are so thankful for the sacrifice of your Son. We're so thankful for the, the hope that he gives us and the, the freedom from sin that we have you know, through, uh, through the grace that you provide. 
Lord, we, we want to thank you for all that you have given us. And at this time, we ask you to please uh, bless this bread that we are about to partake. May we always proclaim you know, the, your Son in everything that we do. May we always remember him for, for who he is. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. And likewise, let's, uh, let's say a prayer for the fruit of the vine. Lord, we are again thankful for what you have given us, and we ask you to please uh, bless this uh, fruit of the vine that we are about to partake of. May we always, uh, always remember you know, what the, the blood of Christ means to us and how it washes away our sins. We want to pray this in your Son's holy and blessed name. Amen. This uh, concludes the Lord's Supper and our, our service on here as well. <clears throat> and so if you ever have you know, any, any comments or any questions concerning our services or any spiritual need that we can help you with, then we ask you to please you know, let us know. You know, let us know on this Facebook page or on our page uh, on, on Instagram and so that we can uh, help you, you know, grow closer to God even though we are separated physically we can still be a people that glorify God in what we do. Hope that you have a blessed week and a very, very good day.